Okay, welcome. Gio and I have two guests today. So we don't do this very often. So there's, it's a party. It's a, it's an early party for me. It's 8 a.m. on the West Coast of the U.S. So we have Jessica Cooper here with us. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Cooper, the Chief Product Officer at the International Well Building Institute, IWBI, and the leaders of the Well Building Standard. Nice to meet you. Perfect. Okay. And Sam, I remember I didn't totally get your title right last time either. So give us your intro. Yeah. So Sam Pickering, I am Head of Sustainability across the Instagram. Perfect. That's easy. Love it. Okay. Well, Gio, do you want to do your intro since you don't know these two? Uh, I, I know Sam. I don't know Jessica. Okay. So cool. Giovanni Palvicini, and I'm a broker in the space that basically helps operators with their growth strategy. And up until opening the doors after and Jamie and I overlap a bit, she's, she's an expert in the operation side of the business and certainly on the site selection and pre-opening as well. But kind of we overlap there in the middle area. And then I'm actually the sitting board member uh, for the Global Workspace Association. Awesome. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So, hence the shameless plug. <laughs> exactly. Well, we didn't we didn't shameless plug uh, publicly, Geo. Do you want to me quickly mention the event in New York? Yeah. So the event in New York is actually December 12th and 13th, and it is going to be down in lower Manhattan in Arch Amenities uh, space at 140 Broadway. And we're, we're really excited because Arch Amenities is a growing amenitization consulting and operating firm that basically goes in and helps landlords with their event space, with their conference space, uh, f &B and even gym. So excited to, to, to have that be our host for the event, but also we'll have an entire day of panels on the 12th and the 13th. We'll actually have uh, tours set up so that people can go look at different tours and we're kind of finalizing that, that route uh, currently, but super excited about uh, that event, it'll be 80 to 100 people typically, so they're a little more intimate, allows for a lot of good interaction. And the beauty of New York is there's a ton of people there, lots of great landlords. So we're making a, a big push towards uh, getting some more landlords and some new faces there. Love it. Awesome. Okay, so today we are here to talk about IWBI's partnership with the Instant Group on developing a well co-working rating. And Sam was on the Everything Co-working podcast in June, I think. And Sam, you predicted very nicely that in October, you would have more to share. So recently, you were at the Well Regional Summit in London, and you officially unveiled the Well Co-working rating, along with a cohort of organizations that have committed to being the first to use the new offering which include a number of very well-known co-working brands in the UK, Cobalt, Landmark, Clockwise, and Iconic Offices. So can you just kind of give us the give us the background, the partnership? Um, Jessica, we're really excited to have you on, um, up in addition to Sam. But, you know, to just to, to talk about the collaboration. And Gio and I just had Kane Wilmot on the podcast. And Sam, I don't, were you, Sam, were you at Juicy a couple oh, of weeks I was, ago? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I so, saw Kane now. Yeah, so you know Kane. So Kane is the CEO of IQ Offices, and they have a portfolio in Canada. So we had Kane on to talk about like what's happening in the UK that's kind of you know on the forefront of co working that we're not quite you know seeing as much of in the US or in Canada. So he 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 just went live today, and one of the things we talked about was the focus on ESG. And he was talking about plants and, you know, some of the really vi visible sort of aspects of of well-being. So this episode kind of dovetails nicely with some of his, his insights. The UK is kind of further ahead on those aspects. And I think the well co-working rating is such an amazing sort of manifestation of that. So, yeah, tell us, kind of give us the the background and, the you know, tell us where you are today. Brilliant. That's a great segue because I caught up with Kane and we discussed this actually because at Juicy, I had a moment on the stage, literally 10 minutes, <laughs> just to talk a little bit about it. Uh, and Kane grabbed me afterwards actually, and we've had some follow-ups, which is great. But I think the background to this is it, it spans from 
I, I'd sort of worked in the world of advising for a long time in a business called Incendium that Instant Group uh, acquired about five and a half years ago. And my team has grown significantly over the sort of 10 years we set up Incendium. And we advise major corporates on sustainability and well-being and so on and so forth. So one of the things I wanted to solve to start with as I got into the world of flex, which I have to say I love now, is, is how do you assist this sector in, in, in sort of starting off in the right direction, specifically on sustainability. So we launched the sustainability index, which is simply a way for operators to report back their carbon emissions to their op occupiers, because the demand from those occupiers simply in terms of compliance reporting or corporate reporting is more and more. And that was something funny enough I discussed with Kang. So sustainability is quite easy. I've done that for a lot of organizations over time. It's all aligned to global agreements called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. So I could do that very easily because it's freely available and so on and so forth. But as we then sort of progress through the Insta Group, well-being across operators is really important. Clearly, we all consume space and, and we want to be productive. We want to know the buildings are healthy. And as corporates start to really adjust their portfolios to, to take advantage of more flexibility in the way people work and so on and so forth, it's very important that a lot of organizations have done well certifications or the rating systems within their corporate offices, but actually on their kind of co-working flex space, there wasn't the ability to do that. And so because at the Instant Group, we've got big scale, I've always been really keen of trying to make as much impact as we can quickly. But as I freely admit, I'm no doctor and I haven't done decades of research and I'm not a huge, huge technical expert in the technicalities of what makes a building healthy uh, in all its aspects. So I've worked with the IWBI for a very long time, so I didn't have to look particularly far to find an expert partner who could assist us with the scale we have across the sector. But the expertise uh, and the brilliance that comes with a load of research that says, if you do this, it will provide this outcome in terms of health for, for the employees working within it. So I approached the IWBI and it's probably two years ago now, and we both agreed that this partnership was well worth going after because the IWBI had developed and certified numerous different buildings and organizations. And Jess can certainly talk more articulately than I can about the IWBI, but it was really to take advantage of uh, and drive healthy be buildings into the operator side, which is always a challenge because operators tend not to control the whole building. You're one floor invariably or a part of a floor within a much bigger building. The landlord is responsible for the majority of things. So it's trying to build the boundaries of what sits within an operator's space, both from the physical aspects within it, and Jess can talk more because I promise you she she knows the, the system far better than me, but also then the operational aspects. And what that does is two things. One is it, it coats so many co-working and flex operators I've spoken to obviously passionately care about it. They're doing loads of things, but there was never the boundaries that said, and more importantly, the kind of proof points that said, this is actually worth going after and this is what you should go after and why. And so that's why we've partnered with the IWBI, but it's very much an IWBI product. We have just partnered with them to develop this specifically for the co-working sector. You're on mute, Jamie. I am on mute. Sorry. I <laughs> love the point. I think this is a big part of what Sam and I talked about when we were um, <clears throat> introducing the concept on the other podcast is, is I had only known a couple of operators in the U.S. that were well certified because it was it's such a major undertaking. Um, and right, you have to get the building owner involved, so you have to either own the building or be on a management agreement and get the you know it's just you know a really high bar. And so I love that you've created something that's so approachable and transparent and reportable. So yeah, tell us, tell us more. Yeah, thank you. And so fun to be on this podcast today. Thanks for having me. IWBI has been setting the standard for what health leadership looks like for over a decade. So as Sam alluded to, we are the experts in how you can build and operate buildings and spaces to promote human health and well-being and really enable people to thrive. 
our well building standard is incredibly robust, very, very holistic, very well researched. There are over 7,000 citations embedded within the 500 plus strategies that are within the well building standard. If you're ever interested, you can take a look at all the strategies. It's free on our website. You can peruse all 10 concepts. Um, you'll see that some of the strategies address the way spaces are designed from an architectural and engineering perspective. Some of the strategies address building operations and building management. Other strategies go into what I like to call people-based policies, things that a workplace well-being manager or an HR manager might put into place. And then we set a pretty high bar for performance outcomes as well for projects pursuing our full certification program. So we actually measure how the building is performing, air and water quality, lighting, acoustics, thermal comfort. And we also require ongoing survey data of the people in the space to understand how they're responding to these strategies. So the well building standard, as I said, covers 10 concepts. You'll have things that look at ways that you can promote good air and water quality, as I mentioned, measuring performance, but also design standards and operational policies that promote those areas. We look at ways to promote healthy eating and better nourishment within the space. We look at lighting quality, both from visual acuity as well as a circadian design perspective. We look at strategies to promote thermal comfort as well as acoustical comfort. We look at ways to enable people to be more active throughout the day in our movement concept. We look at healthy materials as well. And then we have concepts for healthy mind and a connection with the community. So as you can tell, I won't go into all of those. We could spend eight hours talking about all 500 strategies, but you can get a sense for how robust and holistic the standard is. Early on, projects engaging with WELL were pursuing a holistic certification outcome. So they were implementing strategies from across all 10 concepts. They were implementing that full performance testing. Um, as Sam mentioned and alluded to, there was a lot of engagement between tenant and landlord in order to achieve that very high bar of excellence, that pinnacle of health, if you will, in the built environment. But as we continued to engage with organizations and get into market, we found that a couple of things. One is that many organizations wanted to engage with well at scale um, and not only achieve certification for their highest performing buildings and spaces, but also take a more incremental approach for bringing every building um, up to par with a baseline around health and well-being. So sort of starting strategy by strategy or focusing on specific themes within the well standard. And then, of course, other industries, apps, you know, the traditional per commercial office space wanted to also make use of the well standard and not all of the strategies in, were appropriately in scope for those building industries. So we've done a couple of things. We now have a well at scale program, which rewards and incentivizes that ongoing incremental improvement. But we've also released a suite of ratings which focus on a targeted subset of strategies within the standard to either address a specific goal that an organization might have. We have one around health and safety. We have one around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have one around performance. But ratings is also a way that we can focus on a specific industry and really design a well scope that's focused on the way that a particular industry uses space. So in this case, we have the well co-working rating. And what we've done with our in-house standard development team, group of technical experts, is identified the strategies from well that are most appropriate for the co-working space and pulled that into one very succinct, manageable rating for that industry to pursue and earn. Um, one thing that's nice about what we've come up with is that the rating does cover strategies from all 10 concepts of the well standard, so it's very holistic, um, but we've organized them into more targeted action areas for the co-working sector. So we have a section on creating restorative spaces, um, a, a section on promoting productive work environments, for promoting healthy food and good movement, a section on air and water quality, a section on maintenance and operation policies specific to co-working spaces, and finally, a section on providing well-being education and engagement. So organizations do not have to implement every single strategy from the co-working rating to earn the co-working rating. There's about half of the points that are available need to be successfully implemented to get the co-working seal. Um, so relatively high bar, but also very attainable um, and should really help nudge the co-working um, industry along, the flex space industry along as it relates to health and well-being. So I've got a question. 
So obviously, I, I read the post that you made a, a few months back about having come back from your second child. And, you know, so how does being a mother kind of help your way of viewing the 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 continual shift towards better being prepared to, to service mothers and, and people that, that have special requests? Great question. I mean, look, I came into this role with a passion for doing good in the world, right? I want my professional legacy to be one that supports positive outcomes. I have a lot of passion for sustainability in the built environment, as Sam does, and a lot of passion for how we can promote health and well-being through the built environment. I've been at this for 11 years, so very, very committed, very, very passionate about this work. And I think it's always been about putting these evidence-based strategies in the hands of as many people as possible to empower them to live healthier, happier lives. And I've reaped the benefits, right? I mean, I have a lot more knowledge myself about how I can set up my own home, my own work environments to promote my own health and well-being and the health and well-being of my family. And as my family has grown, that point has just become so much more poignant and really striking home why we need to create a future that is more sustainable and healthy for our our young people. Uh, I love and they are the so, you know the the biggest joy in my life. I've got a three year old son and a nine month old daughter, and I want a world that's going to be better for them, that's going to be healthy for them, inspiring for them. So I feel even more driven now coming back to work as a mother of two to continue doing this great work. And certainly the experiences I've had as a working mother make it feel very real why some of the strategies like parental leave policies are incredibly important for keeping mothers in the workforce, why designing lactation rooms that have the proper amenities for nursing mothers to utilize when they come back to work is so key. So I feel like there are some specific strategies within Well that feel that much more personal to me now that I am a mother of two and, you know, reintegrating myself full time back in the workforce. But I wouldn't have it any other way, right? I, I, I love my work. I love my family. And being able to do both feels like, you know, that holistic, fulfilling, fulfilling thing that I need, right? Awesome. Yeah. So, Sam? Um, you, you do you have a personal question for Sam? No, go. No, go. no go. I'll, I'll get I'll get him on the next round. Uh, okay, good. Sam, be prepared. I'm curious about the co-working spaces who have raised their hand. Has has the, have those pilots begun? You know what? Yeah, I, I Sam, I, I feel like when we talked last time, and I should have gone back and listened to our our episode, but that they were lined up, and I mean, you've got folks with multiple locations who I presume are excited to to be able to report against a standard. Can you talk about what that looks like today, and and what that will look like going forward in terms of getting more spaces involved? Like who who would be you know what's the profile of a space that's going to be a good fit for for pursuing the the rating? Yeah, so we, uh, the, the simple answer to that final bit is is any space it really is because it can be used as a guide without doing the rating. Okay. And I think similar to, to Jess's point, you know, the whole purpose of this is to assist the sector to really choose what's right for their space, yeah. but it'd be backed up. But but during the product development, clearly I've had my product team and Jess's amazing team as well, and they've worked in collaboration. Every Friday we've had a two and a half hour call, which has been fantastic since January. The sort of beginning of our weekend and the and the sort of beginning of their Fridays, which which worked has worked really well. But during that, we've also brought in about fifteen operators to really test every single aspect as you go through it, both big and small. Because you know, Cobra is as an example is starting out one while Lamb Milk has got fifty sites within within London as, as another example. But they're also international, so I promise you, this is not just a London fest by any means. So we. So the ones that have signed up, we are we launched this pretty quickly. We'd done all the product development sort of by the end of August. We were then finalizing all the agreement side between the two organizations. So we got to the London summit and that was the big launch. So since then, those five have signed up. And I cannot tell you the positive interaction we've had across the sector in terms of other people looking to sign up. So more and more are. So at the moment we're going through the, there are five that have officially signed up. They're collating all the evidence they require and Jess sort of talked through and gave a snippet of what that looks like. Could be photos, technical documents, policy documents. Uh, and so a number of things need to be tweaked and just, just aligned to what the requirements are. 
but that is going on. So I think in the next two or three weeks, because we allow sort of 10 days uh, at the moment um, to get that um, properly done in terms of the validation, because there's a very thorough process we go through aligned to the IWBI excellence. So we should see in the next two or three weeks, the first one's coming out. So what I would say is at the moment, there are five operators with the majority of their sites, but the the pipeline in terms of interest around this and people asking for more information and contracts being signed, signed out has been extraordinary and that's globally. So yeah, it's it's looking really, really exciting. Can you share who those five operators are? Yeah, so they're like iconic Cobra landmark clockwise and RXR. Thank you. So clearly this is something you're passionate about. I mean, obviously we just heard from Jessica kind of her her children and just kind of her her passion for, you know, preparing the world for them, right? Is is part of her passion. What what's what's your passion behind this and what drives you to want to do this? Well, I I similar to to Jess have actually four children, ranging from 17 today down to twins who are five. So I'm going to be a parent for the rest of my life at chance. But well, obviously I'm going to be, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's never ending. So I, I'm passionate from that side. But for me, I've always been driven. I mean, Jamie and I briefly touched on it, but I had a very different career for about 11 years uh, of flying helicopters in the British Army. And I gave that up and I was, I, my last posting was in Australia. And that is where the effects of climate change are very clear. And uh, I was struck by the lack of sort of movement and, and sort of seriousness. And that was a good 17, 18 years ago now. So I went into sustainability and I've been doing that ever since. And as part of that, the well-being side is hugely, hugely important. You know, clearly saving carbon is important. It's pretty binary, but the health of people and the effects of, of all the changes we've seen across our cities and so on and so forth and buildings as a whole has just driven me. And what I've really found sort of getting into the world of co-working is that we all want to work in a totally different way. And suddenly the scale that instant group has across numerous offices. And I work for some of the biggest Fortune 10 organizations around sustainability and well-being, but that's not 40, 50,000 spaces. And the thing that really I, I drives me is the ability to develop and this is what has driven me in the conversations with the IWBI, but it's to, to, to develop a rating system that is easy to engage with, easy to consume, and steers you in the right direction, but at scale. It doesn't require me to spend hours of consulting time to do that. It is an intuitive, simple, easy to follow process and rating system. And so that's what gets me out of bed. You know, it's one of those things that you develop a product and it suddenly just goes. And you, you, I don't lay back and sort of think, oh, I'm going to retire, but you lay back and you go, wow, I've made an impact. You know, it'll be so many things. And so that is actually now what drives me alongside all the corporate stuff I do. But I think the flex sector is going to become such an important part of how we work, but also part of the solution for the whole net zero, not wanting to change the subject, obviously. That's what really gets me in a bed at the moment and, and, and teases me. Well, the, I mean, the re remote work certainly, I mean, Mark Gilbreth, Sam, I'm sure you know, Mark, I mean, one of his early kind of arguments, you know, pro flex, it, you know, was, you know, reducing carbon, reducing commutes. If you can work, you know, 15, 10, 15 minutes from home versus commuting into London or commuting to Manhattan or, you know, wherever you're commuting to, then that's a, a big win in terms of, you know, c climate effects. So, you know, Flex sort of has that going for it, but then giving folks a way to really align with, you know, the the values and so, some of the technical aspects of, of the built environment is is really exciting. And I love the way I feel like I'm interpreting the, the use of the word at scale means like you've simplified it so anybody can go and do it and also at the level that's appropriate for them. So really anyone can look at the list and say, well, so it, they have to achieve, I heard you say 50%, like roughly 50% of the, you know, check boxes to be, to be, is it a certification, like, so, like to report on it, but they could pursue it sort of on their own, you know, to hit their own goals. Can you just kind of talk a little bit about, about that? 
Yeah, I'm happy to touch on that. And Sam, feel free to layer on, you know, and some of the words I like to use for what the rating represents is that it's targeted and focused, right? So we've taken the larger well standard and essentially removed all of the things that are less relevant for the industry, for the sector, so that when you're looking through the list of strategies, it's already very targeted and focused on what is going to be relevant to you, um, which does make it more simple. But it's not that the strategies are more simple, right? They're still very robust. They're they're evidence-based, and they're going to nudge you to think about things in a slightly different way, maybe a more thorough way than you've ever thought about things before. And that's what will nudge you to have that better impact on the people in your space and, and drive for the positive ROI. So there are 53 points available within the co-working rating, and a location needs to earn 23 to achieve the rating. And they basically compile the necessary documentation, go through a third-party review that everything has been successfully implemented, and then they become well co-working rated. So within the full co-working rating and the 53 points available, I would imagine organizations will focus on the things that are most important to them and or the scopes of work that they have really leaned into within their own spaces. So for example, if providing food on site is really important, you might focus on some of the nourishment criteria and making sure that the food you're providing really promotes healthy eating. There are going to be some strategies that really, I think, should be universally pursued related to promoting movement and better ergonomics through the furniture, even monitoring air quality, for example, so that you know when you need to might make an intervention based on the result of that air quality. So a lot of different strategies to choose from, so still a lot of choice and flexibility within the program, but as I mentioned before, kind of keeping a high level of rigor so that you can have the positive outcomes that you're looking for by pursuing this. Got it. Okay, so the initial five, Sam, you mentioned like a 10-day period. They're compiling their documentation against the points they want to sort of, you know, apply for and then the review is going to get done and then they'll get their rating if they check the boxes. Yeah. Cool. And so they get they get their co-working rate, yep. co- well co-working rating seal, which they get yep. a physical one and then they get a digital one as well. And I have to say what was great, Jamie, is, is I stood on a stage with Rachel Hogden, who ultimately is Jess's ultimate boss, but the CEO of the IWBI, who's so passionate about wellbeing. And she she... But there was a big screen behind us and she put up the co-working seal and there was a gasp from the audience, which I've never had, except probably when I've tripped over on a stage. But it was it was great, actually. And there was a real excitement in the room. It, it really was sort of palpable, which was very exciting. So I think I think I can't deny it'll probably be quite emotional. The first seal that gets gets sent out. So I think for those five, there's a bit of a race on to see who's first. But as I say, <laughs> as I say, the first five. They, they have, but, but the number of, of other people who are signing up at the moment has been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And to your point, you said it's global. So it's not just, I think Kane's, you know, insight, which is probably why he's been hunting you down is I think he sees it because he serves enterprise clients. That's, you know, sort of his ideal customer in his brand in Canada. And he thinks this is next. They're, you know, they're going to want to see evidence of how we're operating and that we align with those values. And so I think he was, you know, really excited about, I, I presume, sort of the rating and, you know, the, the uh, how that aligns with with ESG. You know, well, we di- we're giving props to London, not to make it seem sort of London focused, but but because I think it's, you're just, you know, more advanced on that front than, than the U.S. is. It's just much more of a uh, prominent conversation. Yeah, I think we are on sustainability around carbon emissions and stuff like that. But I think when it comes to well-being, I think that is universal. I mean, IWBI is a a US brand that has global penetration everywhere. And I think that's, that's, you know, clearly for me, wanting to to partner with somebody, IWBI is is the center of excellence around it, but also with the global reach and the brand that sits with it. What I think is fascinating is that for for a corporate real estate team similar to what you just talked about, and Kane's getting a lot of airtime, good good on him. But I think you know that they, they are very aware of that, and so in the corporate in the real estate world, kind of well and lead and all these other things, every, yeah. everyone's aware of those. But actually, suddenly this goes to the mass market, and so I think for consumers of space, be it me and you looking for a space, be it a desk for a day, a meeting room for a day, whatever it might be, I think I definitely 
care about my own well-being. And certainly if I had one or two employees, I care about them. So knowing that there's a seal, like we see a seal on a hotel or something else we might book, I think this also opens up the brand of well to to a far bigger consumer market. And and the other passionate bit, and, and going back to, to your point, Gio, or your question at least, is the other thing that I, I'm passionate about is is it's not just about the corporates. This is about everyone. And I think this is yeah. what this does, as opposed to just businesses who invariably have the wherewithal to know a well certification or well rating exists. This is this is mass, mass market because you are talking about very small businesses as well as the big, big corporates. Yeah. I'm, yeah. So you mentioned, oh, sorry, Jessica, go. I was just going to build on that a little bit and say yeah. that absolutely well is and has always been global um, to Sam's point. Um, we're in about 100 and almost 140 countries, I think, globally with 5.5 billion square feet of real estate number increasing every single get every single day engaging with the program. So it's widespread and it is global. And I think that the, you know, the drive to engage is being driven from a couple of different levels. We've mentioned ESG a couple of times. There's sort of investor pressure and regulatory pressure as well, especially in um, Europe and a couple of other markets. But certainly the investor pressure is is global, I would say, to ask organizations to say what they're doing, not only for planetary health, but also human health and social sustainability. I think organizations are driven from you know, a, a very concrete ROI argument, knowing that if they do what's right for the people in their space, that will be good for their business outcomes. And there's a number of different lenses that organizations are measuring ROI, but, you know, some of them are driven from that internal motivation. And then the reality is that people are getting smarter about this and they're starting to ask for it as well. We engaged Harris Poll in 2023 to evaluate the state of the workforce's sort of engagement and knowledge of well-being. And that poll found that 96% of employees agree that a healthy work environment is necessary for productivity and 81% agree that they're physical work environment has a major impact on their health and well-being, which I think just speaks to the level of awareness that any person is starting to have about how their environment makes a difference. And that's putting pressure on organizations to respond and find, you know, meaningful strategies, evidence-based strategies to put into place to, to respond to that. So Sam, you mentioned RxR. So are they doing, I mean, is so those five, are they all UK based or are there land, for example, RxR has got a huge portfolio in New York. Are they doing that there? Or where are they deploying? Yeah, I think in New York. So it's London, it's definitely the UK, New York, and also over in Asia as well in Singapore. So so yeah, it's it's truly the launch has been global. And actually the, the take up has been without a doubt global as well. And I think Jess, it's fair to say in the world of IWBI, you're seeing growth in terms of well-being everywhere. It, it's not just the US or an, a Europe or a, an APAC, it's everywhere. Agree. Well, and, you know, I, I realized I was kind of talking about like ESG and corporate occupiers and, to, and totally. And I think the, the point you're trying to make is like, well, everybody, not just, you know, people who work for larger companies want access to that. Like, I mean, even Jess, I'm looking at your beautiful background with your plants. And, <laughs> and I, I also think, so I think people want it. And I was just thinking through, you know, one of the challenges we have in, in Flex is like, getting people, you know, how do you get people out of their house and into, yeah, exactly. you know, Jess, you, I'm guessing you're at home. You have this lovely office that you created during the pandemic and there you are. And it works for you. You have two small kids. So that's probably the, the best solution. But, you know, for flex operators, you know, well, how do we get people to come out of their home office? Well, unless you're Jess, you probably don't have such a healthy work environment at home. And, you know, if if you can walk into a place that's sort of set up to support your well-being versus kind of having to, you know, worry about it at home. I don't have any plants in my home office. That's for sure. I was just thinking like, why don't I have any plants? I need to work on that. Healthy food options, like all those things kind of like just taken care of because I'm even, you know, I'm thinking like, well, this group on the podcast is, you know, pretty sensitive and focused on well-being and, and maybe it's easier for us. It's already like integrated into our lifestyles, but a lot of people are still working on those things, right? And so if they can sort of opt into a place that just like nudges them, like we've just done these things for you. We already have the plants and the great lighting and, you know, sunshine and 
and we're not serving only pop tarts. <laughs> I always remember, I think Nick Clark, who uh, was the CEO of Common Dust, said their their best-selling snack in their across their locations was Pop-Tarts. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> it, that might have been amongst other unhealthy treats. So a yeah. couple of things. One, I was just in New York. I love going back to New York and working amongst my colleagues. There's no replacement for in-person time. You're right that right now this, this homework environment suits me with my small children. But you know, I love going into the office and having office space available. So just wanted to make sure everybody on the on the line listening knew that I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, but I, you know, there are so many things that are much more, much easier to implement in a shared office space than they are for each individual to try to implement within their own home. And ultimately, it's much more equitable as well to provide those types of amenities within a workspace versus trying to provide, you know, such a thing within people's home environments, it's much messier variable, right? Some of the things you mentioned as being obvious, but even you know, ways to promote better air quality and filter the air is something like the mechanical systems in office spaces are set up to do that. It's much more difficult to do that in one's home, providing ergonomic furniture, you know, and making sure that that's been set up at, at scale within an office space is so much easier, supporting better sound and acoustics, right? I mean, a lot of people don't have the ability to control that within their own home at all. So being able to provide that in an office makes that available to people and ultimately does provide you know, a more productive work environment and and one that is also, you know, promotes well-being and better better place for people to work. I So anyway, I, I'm just agreeing with you that I think there's a lot that can be done in a designed office space that is much more difficult to provide for people in individual home office environments. So drawing people into, into the workspace, I think, can really point to, again, I'll say very meaningful health and wellness strategies that aren't accessible there's a lot to be said about, hey, we've got a gym here, we've got a game room, and like those types of amenities. But in a way, I feel like people are looking for more than that now, things that maybe they haven't even thought of. Or once they're introduced to those things, they say, yes, I do need that. And that's not something I can have at home. And I think that's what well and the co-working rating can provide. And it gives almost a, a new communication tool that owners can use to say this is what we've put in place without having to get into all of the, the nitty-gritty research that that backs up their decisions. And I want to share one more story about the Pop-Tart. So we had an early client, um, this is a construction company based out of New York who was pursuing well certification. And there are some mandatory requirements when you pursue certification, basically things that every certified project must do that span all 10 concepts, including nourishment. And so they were looking to comply with those mandatory requirements and the nourishment concept, which essentially meant that they had to switch out everything in their vending machine to be aligned with healthier standards. And their vending machine provider basically said to them, like, we can't do this. I'm not going to be able to run a profit. I'll have to take my vending machine out of your space. Please don't do this. And they say, we need to try. It's mandatory for the certification we're pursuing. We're going to pilot it for at least a year, right? So they switch out the vending machines. Um, and that vending machine uh, provider, that that service provider was um, proven wrong. He came back. He said, you know what? Not only have I been making my profits, but we are selling more food in this healthy vending machine than we were before. And so I think part of well is is about nudging, making the healthy yeah. choice the easier choice. And people don't always know what they want or need. But if you put those healthier choices in front of them, they do gravitate towards them and they feel better and it creates new habit cycles. And, you know, it's a win-win. I think, Jamie, just also just building on that slightly just quickly is that I was talking to uh, another operator who's again uk based wizzy yesterday who are really keen on this and, th and the other thing we were just discussing is similar to what jess has just articulated brilliantly is obviously this the the, the well co-working uh, co rating seal which is really important but actually everything you then do in terms of initiative gives you something to assist in the marketing of why you've done it because it's backed up by all, all the research and the findings and the proof points that say this is why yeah. it's good and so I think that again is an education piece, but it's sisted with marketing far beyond just the seal. And I yeah. think that's an important point to get across. Yeah. Although I, I mean, I, I'd be curious, you know, what you think elicited the gasp around the seal. And I, I mean, my first thought was like, it's a tool to, to communicate. So, you know, quickly, like the things that are so important to these operators 
and and to just signal, you know, very quickly, this is what we stand for and this is what you can expect in one of our spaces and then write language to talk about it. And so, you know, not for like any sort of hubris sort of reason, but to write, explain to people like, here's here's why you might be happier here. You know, they're the people who like, yes, of course, I'm going to get an office space outside of the home. Like that's their default. But for op- a lot of operators, and this may not be the problem in central London, where occupancy tends to be very high, but in other places, people are still trying to educate, like, well, why is flex, you know, a good option? Why might it be better than working at home or commuting or, and I think, you know, it's it's such a beautiful tool to explain. I will also say, sharing a little bit of a, a personal story. So my co-working space brand was called Enter Space, and I started in, in Chicago in 2012, and it was completely out of wanting to create a healthy workplace. In 2012, in the Midwest, offices were were not necessarily, you know, more often than not, not what you see today, even in cities like Chicago. And I wanted to do things like have recess, like promote movement. And, you know, help. we did some of the things that are, you know, on your list, healthy eating, you know, workshops. We had, you know, dietitians that were part of the membership. But I remember feeling challenged, like, this is kind of weird. Nobody's doing this, you know? And and of course, back then, it, people weren't doing it as much. But having, like, a research, a, you know, based structure framework that I could say, like, well, this is why we do this, even if it seems a little weird. This is what, you know, what we're going to do, sort of help, you know, help people be a little more brave in terms of what they're integrating into, you know, what they might be asking members to do. Because, for you know, for me, movement is one of those things I'm super, you know, focused on help. And yet I'll still go like seven hours and sit here and go Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting, and, you know, not get up and take the break and, you know, walk the dog or whatever. So I also just love like kind of helps with the language and the like sort of maybe get over that hurdle of like, well, it's weird that we don't have Pop-Tarts or it's weird that we're going to, you know, you know, have have recess at lunch and we're all going to take a walk together or, you know, whatever. So, yeah. So I, question, I Sam. Of- Oh, sorry, Jessica. We keep doing this, Jessica. Go. You got to <laughs> That's I totally agree. And I think I'm constantly astonished, given that I've been in this work for 11 years. A lot of the strategies seem like they should be best practice. And you start to explain some of them and they become like, oh, well, that's obvious. But yet the majority of... We're not doing it. Yeah. We're, we're not doing it. And so like it, it really does create not only the common language, but the practical solutions too. If you identify a problem and you don't know what to do about it, then that feels just disabling. But if you present the challenge as well as a solution, then people can actually take the steps to do things better, which feels more empowering and exciting than anything else. And I do want to say too, it's okay to eat Pop-Tarts in your well co-working space uh, <laughs> or you know at home or whatever the case may be. The point is that it's you're providing more well-balanced choices and people have the opportunity to pick an apple as well. So don't be scared about so, <laughs> the pop tart oh, police the pop tart police by any means <laughs> so sam i've got a question with as involved as you've been with uli and coronet i mean how do we get the enterprise community be it the real estate directors and everyone on the enterprise side to be better aligned with the co-working operators and so that we can deploy some of these things in a fashion that we're all rowing in the same direction. It seems like there's a disconnect, like everyone's in different buckets. And part of what we're trying to do is how do we bring everyone together to cohesively come up with solutions? Yeah, and I think, you know, that that's definitely part of my mission. I'm trying to do both with the sustainability index and now the world co-working rating is it aligns and takes away any barriers for those cor- corporate enterprise clients. Because I found from the emissions reporting as an example, I'm not going to get into the complexities of sustainability, but in really simple terms, they need emissions to report for those compliance in their own corporate reporting. Part of the problem was is FlexBase could never give it to them. And so by doing what we've done, it then allows you to report with confidence aligned to a proper protocol, how you do that. Now, it didn't matter in the olden days when people didn't have a larger proportion of flex space, but as that's grown over the last three, four years, it's actually material. 
And it's also linked to share price because you start reporting poorly, it's got a problem. So by doing that, that is one of the differentiation points and just driving that sector to say, no, 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 I can provide you with data. And then I go back to, to the well-being side, which is, look, we're aligning to your corporate headquarters. This is why it is inverted commas safe and as good as your headquarters to work in. And so it's those nudges for those corporates that work. But I think your challenge is a good one, Gia, that I'd love to talk again around how we can really engage with the cornets and so on and so forth, because this is such an important sector going forward that will become the norm and it won't be looked at as like this, this weird adjunct to real estate. It'll be because we as consumers of space and office consumers in whatever form will look at this totally differently. I guarantee it in five, 10 years, and you know this year better than me and so do you, Jamie, but this is my sort of view on the world. So I think how we can show how we are moving the sector forward together and making this easy for operators to comply with some of the standard standards that you have in these great big tower blocks, I think will only add to to the knowledge of that. And I think if you can do that at scale across all the, the lots and lots of operators that are out there, that is certainly one of my missions. And, and that's linked to the whole industry without a doubt, because that's what we want to do, strive more demand to, to, to the sector. Yeah, and, and, and just actually, you know, yeah. Yeah. sorry, I would just say is that, you know, I, I haven't done this in like a, a silo of IWBI instant group and loads of operators. This is because I, I hear every client that I work with. And as I say, they are major corporates who are looking at flex space and this just makes buying decisions far, far easier. Yeah, and I think the question I would ask you, Jessica, is along the same line, but how, obviously, I work with a bunch of landlords and developers, and how do we get them to align with the enterprise and the co-working operators as well? Because, I mean, part of it is it's not cheap to 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 do some of these well certifications, right? And so as we're looking at new deals, how how do we, obviously, that a lot of it comes back to to financials, right, and and the cost. And so... You know, how are, how can we help bridge that gap as we have these conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think that conversations are key, right? And creating more awareness around what we want and need in our real estate can help move the needle, raises demand. And the more people who are demanding this, the more that nudges organizations to move if they aren't otherwise motivated by their own ROI or, like I said before, investor or regulatory pressure. So helping to create that demand, I think, is key. I also think that there are probably resources that can and should be created for co-working operators to take to the landlord to say, hey, we are doing this. Here are some opportunities we'd like to talk through with you. How willing are you to implement some of these things that might be more uh, better suited for the base building? Um, and that could be a talking point, even if that base building is not going to pursue a full well certification or their own well rating, that that's at least a talking point for the operator to engage in a conversation about. But, you know, we've intentionally designed the co-working rating so there isn't a dependency on the landlord. But ultimately, being brave and having that conversation, you know, will ideally nudge the landlord to to take their own scope into their own hands and implement well standards within the base building. And we do have um, certifications and ratings that are more catered towards base building landlords. And we also have guidance for landlords about how they can interpret the well requirements for the base building scope specifically. Again, wanting to make sure that the evidence-based strategies translate to every type of scope that um, is relevant, right? So we definitely have ways for landlords to take a bigger leap. And many of them have, you know, the real estate sector, commercial office sector has been incredibly brave pioneering the well standard enterprise wide, portfolio wide, which is great to see, but we need more. And I think how we do that is by creating demand and having those conversations. It's interesting, Gio, and linked to that is I've had a number of landlord organizations who are looking at becoming, you know, opening their own flex space. And I've had two specifically, one in the UK and one over in Japan, extraordinarily, who got hold of me on day one. And they actually have often got well certifications for their buildings, but actually they are really keen as they go into the co-working and flex space is to do the same and get and get the well co-working rating, which which was a surprise to me, if nothing else. The other thing I'd say about price is that we have deliberately made this as 
intuitive and um, prescriptive as we can for operators. So there's not the requirement to get external support necessarily to do this. And and because we want to do this at the mass market, clearly larger operators have bigger budgets and so they, they can get third parties to help them with it. But for single site operators, it is, you know, you will never pay more than $1,250. Clearly there are changes you will have to do internally around the things you do, but the flexibility of the rating that Jess talked about, you know, the 53 points having to achieve 23 allows you to, to pick what you want to do that suits your own space. So this is not meant to be a high cost element for the co-working space. And I just wanted to get that point really firmly across. Clearly, it's 1250 for one site and it's a volume-based model. So it goes down quite significantly as you add more, but, but that is the premise behind the model and, and this whole sort of rating system as a, as a whole. Sorry, Jamie, I was doing serious questions. I know it throws you off when I do that. So I, I know it totally threw you off. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> Journalist Gio or. <laughs> is 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 out. No, I those are great questions and in a great conversation. Okay, Gio, I have another interview in four minutes. So we gotta wrap this up. Any final questions for our guests? Nope. You've got you've got the final question always. Oh, okay. I, I might skip my final, final question. Well, what so we've used the word scale. What do you think this does look like in scale? Like what what do you hope, you know, in five years, if we were to, you know, get back on the podcast, what would we say the landscape looks like in terms of the the well co-working rating? I genuinely, well, well, well into the thousands, excusing the pun with well, well, but I really do. I think this is a massive scale initiative that this partnership drives. And, and I, I'm really hoping that this drives in the way it is. And certainly we're two weeks in and it's been extraordinary. So I think you'll see thousands of these. And I'm hoping through see this, we will start to see the data that comes out of this in terms of the demand for such a space, potential premiums, the health benefits that have been driven. And this again is where this great partnership with the IWBI and, and us at Instant is, is, is really, I'm hoping, going to transform this sector. Yeah, I would agree. And I think grounding that even more is to say that five years from now, I hope that there are enough co-working spaces that are well co-working rated so that any individual, any organization could demand a well co-working space in the major markets around the globe. And I think that is a totally reasonable expectation to to track over the course of the next even, you know, two to three years. So well, I'm okay, super excited to keep having those conversations. A hundred percent. I was going to go back and Gia wants me to end this on a fun note. So Jessica, you get, you get a night out without the kids. You and your husband decide to go karaoke. What's your song? Shake it off. Taylor Swift. Ooh. And I'm not even really a Swifty, but that song gets me That's every it. time. So you did not even have to think twice. I know. Right? Oh, no. Sam's turning red over there. He's like, okay, oh, not, at at all. not at all. There's there a whole play on <laughs> What, what's, what's yours, Sam? What's yours? Uh, Judo, weirdly, it'll be Take That and Never Forget. I don't know if you lot know Take That, but it was a boy band back in the 90s. They were fantastic. Whoa. Take That, never. I'm going to have to go back and look that up. What we'll does Kurt, Kurt if he knows that one? I'll get well, a load of abuse okay. for that. But anyway, we'll. we'll, well I like we'll, it, but we'll also, no hesitation right off the top of the head. I love it. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you Thank guys you for taking so the time to do this. We appreciate it. Thanks, Good everyone. Good to see you. Take care. Thanks.